Hello, hello. This is a, a call to order so that we can continue with the program. My name is Francesco Spagnolo. I'm the curator of the Magnus uh, collection. It's so wonderful to have everyone here uh, today and the conversation already started in, in such a, a comprehensive way. Uh, we have uh, four distinguished presenters. You have their biographies. They were distributed to you, so I'm not going to recite their biographies for you, but the order of the speakers uh, is Alexandra Verbalov, the composer, Bill Morrison, the filmmaker, Drew Cameron, who is in charge of the Combat Paper Project and who will be holding a workshop to here tomorrow in this very same room, and David Harrington of Kronos Quartet. Um, um, as I was uh, thinking about, uh, about today's uh, conversation, last week I was traveling across the Midwest, and for me, for an Italian, it's really a, it feeling very de paese, very like off uh, the, the map to be in the Midwest. But uh, I, I was thinking about my own database of, of music and war, and especially of World War I, and uh, how, for me, in a way, the sound of the reflections uh, on World War I uh, begin with, with the String Quartet Plus. Uh, in uh, 1918, Arnold Schoenberg uh, established in Vienna the Society for Private Musical Performances. It was in the fall of 1918, very much as the, the armistice for the end of World War I was being negotiated. And it was, a, it was a private society so that people who were looking for glamour would not attend the concerts and not disturb the presentation of new music. But among the pieces that were uh, presented in the course of those early years uh, were uh, Arnold Schoenberg, Anton Weber, and, and Alban Berg's uh, transcriptions of um, Johann Strauss' quartets. And uh, the, yes, that's right. right. It's and very significant. It's, yes. it's like uh, they were creating comfort food uh, that, in music. Yeah, yeah. In, in a way. Yeah. But the other way to look at it, they, they, they kind of reduced the grandeur mm -hmm. of, of Strauss's orchestras to the, to the quartet, which is almost, in, in, in a way, that, that's the way I've listened to this music uh, over the years. It's like a skeleton with a uniform, with the uniform of the, of the uh, Austrian Empire walking around and, <laughs> and, and sort of walking around Europe. So that, that with this sort of uh, sound image, I wanted to introduce our uh, distinguished speakers and just um, say how ideal it is to have this conversation at the Magnus and how this collaboration with Cloud Performances is particularly meaningful. So without further ado, Alexander, if you want to take the microphone and speak sure. about your work and your collaborations. Yes. Um, hi, I'm really thrilled to be here and thank you for being here. Um, when I was asked by David Harrington to uh, be a part of this collaboration and this project, and that was several years ago, I think three years ago. Um, I, I was very excited. First of all, because um, growing up in Europe, uh, First wo World War was extremely important for, um, for all of us there. Uh, then I lived, I was in Serbia during the, the NATO bombing, and uh, since then I I always question the role of an artist because at times like that we feel so powerless. Um, although maybe it doesn't seem like that from the outside, but uh, what we do seems so abstract and so impossible to turn anything around, especially when the events are so dramatic. Um, so since the, the 99 and, and the, the NATO bombing, I, I always looked for ways to express um, and comment on the reality, especially if it is about the war. So I was really grateful to, to David and Kronos to ask me to, uh, to do the piece. And also, just uh, in thinking about those last um, 100 years, uh, in my family, there were five family members, five men who participated in World War I, um, four survived. Uh, they were Serbs, but since we were from the part of the country that belonged to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, they fought against the Serbs and then um, some against their own nation, and um, somehow they managed to uh, cross to the other side. and. Um, it was as traumatic as not crossing. So 
uh, there, there, there was that contradiction in um, the, the conflict uh, in, um, in the family, where you belong and how, how you see heroism and what is a patriotic thing to do. Are you loyal to your country or are you loyal to the, the, the idea of your identity? So th those, those are really, those, those have been really big questions um, uh, uh, in, in the family. And then in the Second World War, um, I, I have several, uh, several um, relatives lost lives and my grandfather is a national hero. So another question of heroism came up and what does it exactly mean? And would, be, would uh, all of us be happier at home if we had him instead of uh, hearing the stories about um, he, his bravery against the, 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 the Nazis? Um, and then the 99 came. So basically, I'm the third generation in a row where we do have a war experience. So this piece was also a way to putting all of that uh, in some different context uh, to, to unify those three very different experience, experiences generationally into um, a vision that could be uh, that could make us maybe look into um, what we need to <laughs> avoid instead of how we can, how can we not be heroes? That would be uh, maybe the topic of, uh, of the piece. So the, you know, heroism and patriotism, those are the words that we also here in the States, we, we use them so lightly and uh, rarely ever thinking about the complexity of that, uh, and if anything in the piece, that was that was a big thing for me to 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 explore. So really, there are no heroes, even if there are heroes. Sometimes it's just so much harder uh, to to choose a, a different path. Um, so uh, when it came to decisions about the piece itself and how it would unfold. I, I was, I, I had, I have had these incredible three collaborators and David stands for more people than himself because there is the whole quartet that David here represents. And uh, David and I had a lot of um, correspondence about the piece and a lot of talks and we have been exchanging uh, music that was either written at that time or written after the war but was uh, heavily influenced by it. Uh, and we, we created the whole world in which for me also it became uh, so clear that the way we, the way I relate to war is actually not through the uh, the war narratives of, of politicians or even historians, but that I, that I understand what it was and how it was through the response to war of artists who participated in it. And in the first world war, what was so fascinating is that so many of them had uh, ideals at the beginning of the war uh, that of course fell apart the moment when they um, ended up being on the front. So that kind of um, change, that kind of transformation um, is something that I also tried to uh, apply on the, to apply in the piece, the piece itself, the, the clarity of form and the, 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 the clarity of vision, at least it seemed to them that things were clear, uh, we have that at the beginning of the piece, and then as the piece progresses, um, there is decay and disillusionment, and um, the world that already uh, started to go into fragments and not, not to look like anything before. So the experience that they had to go through within those war years, this is in a way structurally I think you're yeah you're seeing the you're, you're seeing some of my drawings you know the, how I organize the piece, um, so up, up 
two thirds or almost three quarters of the piece is a gradual dis disintegration of all materials. Also, um, uh, Mark mentioned the futurists and uh, there is something about that quality at the beginning. We, the piece starts as a well-oiled machinery that becomes rustier and rustier and, um, and the world as we have known it, uh, that does not exist anymore. Um, so that was through um, my talks with David that I came to the, the formal idea of, and, and you know how to organize the piece. The next very important step was uh, my trip to uh, the Library of Congress in Culpeper where they have the audio and video uh, preservation uh, site, the archive, and Bill Morrison took me there uh, to go through the, uh, I think there were thousands of reels that we that we looked through, uh, basically just selecting those nitrate reels that, that were um, made between 1914 and 1918. And then we would take them out. You, do you want to talk about that later, or I can say? But I want your perspective. OK, so I'll, I'll give my, um, how, how it looked to me. So we, we, we would take those films, pick the, the ones that, are, that had the dates that were right, and then look through them sometimes on the projector, but more often not on the projector because they were so old and, um, and brittle that you couldn't really run them through the projector. So we would look at them with the loop and you know, the light and glass, and it was so amazing to, to have that personal and close contact with faces soldiers and um, whoever was involved just seemed so so serious about that and so not so aware of the camera also which which was another amazing thing that the presence of the camera where they felt they they needed to be presentable but another thing that 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 really influenced the thing my thinking about the music is that most of the things were staged. So the brutality of the fact that those guys are running over the battlefield after the battle was finished, just so that that can be captured and sent back to the, to the places of power uh, was heartbreaking. So, I also think that the, 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 the painful quality uh, that Mark was mentioned when, when he watched the film, when he saw the piece, comes from that because there, there, there was that realization in, in, in seeing those films that um, everybody was, was somehow like in scissors of reality. And wherever you go, there, there is really no way to to escape the brutality of it. If you, if you lose on the battlefield, a lot of people are dead and you, it's a loss. If you win, you have to run over your friends' dead bodies and pretend uh, that you know, you're, you're a hero, things are great. Uh, so the experience at the Library of Congress was, uh, was Crucial. So I saw the the footage. I didn't see the the film was done after the music. So um, I saw the the snippets of the footage, and that was enough for me to have the to know what kind of uh, texture and atmosphere we would be able to create also visually. And then my collaboration with Drew was. Um, also, you the audio archive. Right? And there was the audio archive, yes. I used some of the materials. I'll get to that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then my, my meeting with Drew, my third collaborator, was very important for another reason. It wasn't about art. It was about the fact that um, the two of us were on the opposite side of what you would look at the war experience. Drew is a war vet veteran, and I was, uh, I, I survived the air raids. Um, and and um, 
it, it's a very interesting dynamic. And the, the fact that we would um, make those experiences into works of art and that we would meet in that uh, point, it's not even a middle point, it's the point somewhere so much higher than our regular, ordinary citizens' military lives were, um, that there is that place, it's the place of art and creativity where we can really uh, connect and transcend uh, those experiences and turn them into something that uh, we can share with everybody. That that was really uh, that that was a powerful realization, and also very tied to the fact, um, to the thing that I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the, the role of art in World War One and how that is was a mechan mechanism to uh, survive. Do I have more time? I do. <laughs> okay. Um, so a little bit maybe about the piece itself. Um, it has two main elements. One is the, um, the acoustic element, which is, of course, Kronos Quartet. And this is the decay that I was talking about. So they, they start as a well-oiled machinery, and then little by little, as the textures in the film disintegrate, the sound also disintegrates, as the idealism disintegrates and becomes awareness and disillusionment, uh, this, is the, this is the narrative of the acoustic material. And then at some point towards the end, there is something that uh, we might call a coda. Uh, in the coda, there we are at a different plateau. Um, the world did fall apart. It doesn't exist the way it had existed before. Uh, but there is a point where after facing the, 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 the tragedy and fear and destruction as all of you or all of us who did survive war, there is a tiny, tiny, tiny point of, um, of incredible potential, the awareness that things do not have to be the way they are. And um, that tiny point of awareness when uh, somebody's lost or things are lost, lives are lost, um, we have to continue. And um, that huge potential is, is still the question that, uh, that it's so hard to, um, it's so hard to understand how can we keep repeating it? How can we can how can we keep repeating in repeating it when when, when we have a hundred years of uh, awareness of what what it means to to be in in war? So that that very last part, the coda, is ba basically about that. This is the beyond zero point, um, a, a short moment of awareness or a catharsis that could turn. Um, us, the humanity, towards a world where there are no wars, but somehow we just cannot, uh, we just cannot have it happen. Uh, the second element, besides the acoustic element, there are uh, archival materials in the piece that I use, and some of them are from the from the wartime. Um, there, for in, the piece begins with Bela Bartok playing his own piano suite that he wrote in 1916. And I wanted to, again, bring the sound of that time and the tonality uh, falling apart and disappearing, but still having Bela Bartok who, who composes during the war. And during the NATO bombing, I composed every day because that's another very strong realization. We all do what we have to do. If you have to compose, you have to compose. Somebody needs to throw bombs and you know, sometimes it's just as simple as that. Um, so Bela Bartok did compose. Uh, Richard Hulsenbeck, the Dada poet, he did write poetry, and um, I have also used uh, um, uh, chorus, um, chorus cantus from, um, from 1916 uh, that he recites in his own voice a little later. Uh, but then to juxtapose the, 
the art and creativity with what also is happening in the war. I have the loyalty speech. That's the one that I got in the Library of Congress audio archive. The loyalty speech by um, James Watson Gerard, who was the US ambassador to Germany. And in the loyalty speech, he um, addresses in a, in a really threatening, um, um, threatening voice, no, not by the way it sounds, but what those words say, he threatens um, uh, Germans who live in the States. He basically tells them that uh, they, they have to be careful what they're doing because they, they cannot support their, um, their homeland uh, because they will be shipped back uh, dead. Uh, so, so to hear that speech, together with the Dada speech, uh, it's really amazing how the Dada speech, which is like the glory of nonsense, uh, becomes so, makes so much more sense than, <laughs> than the, the, the speech of a politician uh, talking about the war in, in, in words and language that we think we understand. So that's in the pre-recorded material. Also to connect all the wars, because I, I, I saw our piece as not, it's not a piece about the history. It's really a piece about wars that have been happening, about the state of war, the, the state of mind of war that uh, somehow we keep carrying. Uh, so I have the, the I have the loyalty speech, and then I use the recording of air raids in London from 1943, uh, and from our very recent history, the military commands from the Bosnian wars from the 90s. So there is that also linear, um, the thread that uh, takes us through different uh, times with wars. Uh, the piece ends with a recording of Serbian monks uh, chanting um, uh, a Byzantine chant. And I really wanted to involve somehow uh, my Serbian background because it was also so important um, as the part of the world where it was all happening. But I also wanted to, to place Serbian um, to place that music that's so related to my background into a context that would really um, be almost like a requiem for everybody who died in the war. So again, it's not about Serbia, it's just the, the language and um, the, the background that, that I have and I know well, uh, and I'm using that old chant to um, almost as a matter of reconciliation and um, if we could go back in the history uh, where those two footsteps were, um, maybe it's in a way great that they're not there anymore uh, because why would anyone want to step in them? So. Um, and you mentioned also T.S. Eliot, The Wasteland. Uh, there is one beautiful thing about the ending of the poem. It ends with shanti, 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 peace, peace, peace. And um, there are so many other sounds and incredible images and quotes from other, um, other literary works. And there is the density that only a mind that, that knows that war could produce. But then, again, how do we end it all? How do we bring it to, um, to a conclusion other than with the idea of peace? And um, I, this is something similar that happens in Beyond Zero. Uh, that this is that transcendental coda uh, where it's, it's really about the peace and tenderness for, for um, for us, even with the idea, the, the, the knowing that we still don't know how to stay uh, in peace. I think that's all for me for now. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. So um, as, I, as I announced before, I think we should just really go through all of your 
uh, ideas and, and show and tell because you, you all brought documentation to, to discuss your work. So uh, we, can, we can now hear from Bill Morris. Well, thank you, Alexandra. That was beautiful. Um, and thank you, David and Janet, for inviting me into this project. And uh, Drew, I've been collaborating with for uh, the last few months, sending him images when I can. And um, it's really been an exciting project. I met David, I guess, uh, maybe three years ago. Um, I think it was on my birthday. Uh, um, and we immediately uh, uh, embarked on a collaboration right there on the spot. Um, that one, uh, dealing with the protests that were going on um, in the Occupy movement. Um, and uh, they, Kronos turned around and performed a, a piece that I edited for them only a few months later. And then we started talking about this piece. And it's been a really exciting process to uh, be a part of. Um, just to give you a little bit of background on um, how I work, um, as a filmmaker, um, I do shoot film, but it's mostly sort of as a notebook. Um, the films that I generally release to the public and that I'm known for um, are ones where I've really mined archives um, for, um, and, and using archives in many different ways. Um, here I'm listed as a documentary filmmaker. Uh, before this, I would be called an experimental filmmaker or someone who generally uses, it makes image-based films and films that work with music expressly. So I have a long collaboration of matching archival images to uh, original compositions. Um, what struck me about this piece um, is that now we're 100 years uh, past the birth of cinema and, and now 100 years into the first major event that was captured in cinema, uh, the First World War. And Alexander mentioned how much of it seemed false to her, um, the, uh, you know, the awareness of a camera and how it would be impossible to bring these big cumbersome machines out onto a battlefield. Um, and so that it was really the birth of propaganda or in the use of cinema as, as a, uh, a device to sway opinion. Um, but also, and what was really critical for our uh, mining for these images and um, this particular project took me down to uh, Culpeper, I think on four different occasions, um, was to find actual film that had passed through cameras 100 years ago and been printed. And it was actually that artifact um, that existed today and was being uh, really saved from a ruin um, in this project. Virtually every image you'll see associated with this project probably would not be seen again um, had it not been for this reclamation because these are uh, nitrate images that are uh, again on the precipice of being thrown away. Um, I have an outstanding relationship with the nitrate vault manager down at the Library of Congress and he will set aside certain roles that he thinks um, probably cannot be saved because some of you may know nitrate film as it gets old and sticky and dusty and uh, it can become flammable and it can also act like a, a cancer for the rest of the collection. So it really needs to be excised and, and thrown away into a big vat of bubbling mess. And, uh, uh, but luckily for me, there's something called the Bill Morrison shelf, um, which is a, a kind of limbo for these films, you know, that before they are, are dropped into the inferno, they have one last chance, you know. Um, and, uh, and with my collaborators at the uh, Color Lab in Rockville, Maryland, uh, who soak this stuff and then uh, very painstakingly uh, unroll it and um, make uh, high definition scans, we have reclaimed these images and also we've reclaimed the physicality of the film that they were carried on. Uh, uh, there you see a roiling emulsion that these images are, are fighting to be seen. Um, and I think there's a war going on there. It's a war of uh, attrition, of course. It's a, it's a war of impermanence. And also it speaks to our own amnesia um, that soon these images would be lost and, um, and, and 
it's only through kind of picking through the, uh, the remains that uh, we're able to find a few left. Um, it's very moving to hear Alexandra speak because, of course, this isn't just a second 30-year war. It's a continuation of a 100-year war. We're not really commemorating a centenary as much as we are um, bemoaning the fact that we are still at war. You know, we haven't found peace. This is all a continuation from this first shot, quite accidentally, perhaps, or randomly thrown a uh, hundred years ago. Um, and so there's an element of that in this footage, too, this randomness, um, this chance that here are these few images that remained that were um, teetering on the edge. And uh, as Alexandra also alluded to, it's a film that is apolitical. Um, it as much embraces the German soldier as it does the Canadian soldier. Uh, it, it's, it's about soldiers, and it's about uh, men fighting with, at first, bayonets, or as Mark mentioned, uh, fresh-faced boys boarding ships, and, uh, and then marching in formation, and then uh, digging trenches and exercises, and then running across actual batter, battlefields with actual corpses there, uh, whether it was staged or not. Um, this was the reality that they were living at the time. Um, cannons being fired and then tanks and airplanes. Uh, the, the war machine swallowing up these fresh-faced boys. And uh, um, it's as much that narrative beyond any nation was uh, how the modern jaws of technology were a technology of death. And, um, and that, in a way, is the thing that we released that we could not put back in the bottle. Um, I guess talking a little bit about uh, going down to um, Culpeper, uh, Alexander and I, we were, we were finding little pieces of rolls of film that had no provenance in all, at all. Um, maybe a collector had found it in a barn and given it to the library. Um, they were wrapped into tiny little spindles. They weren't even on cores. They were just uh, maybe the size of a pencil, and they'd been wrapped very, very tightly. And so she would take one end, and I would take the other, and we were able to unfurl these things. But if one of us let go, it would snap back. And so we were uh, you know, rushing against the clock to try to tape these things together. And, and first, we were just organizing them by color. It was like, OK, all the blue ones, you know, and then all the yellow ones. And, Eventually, we made this beautiful roll that looked like a mandala because it had, it it wouldn't uh, wind perfectly round. It, it had all these bumps to it and and then layers of color. Um, so that was a really great experience of just working hands on and of course uh, trying to watch something on a moviola. And um, Alexandra would record the the sound of this brittle film as it was going through the. Uh, uh, through the rollers and across the viewer. And of course, this was a, an incredible vote of confidence that the library had given us to allow us to view original nitrate film on a viewer. That's, um, it was a very exceptional and rare opportunity. And uh, um, so we really immersed ourselves in, in these fragments. And then um, as I came to know how Drew worked, um, um, and his interest in, uh, in not just war imagery, but the, the soldiers themselves. And as I would send uh, images to him, I could tell more and more that he was interested in the faces of the, the people who had fought. And uh, so uh, when I finally finished a, an edit just a few weeks ago, Drew was one of the first people I sent the, the cut to so that he could go through and and pick more images to, um, to, to do his incredible process with, which he'll explain a little bit more. Um, I did bring a clip to share with you guys, um, just because I think it's, well, as Mark said, it's more instructive than any of our words could be, um, just to, to show our collaboration rather than to talk about it. Um, so thanks so much for your help. and. Uh, we're going to watch a few minutes of uh, 
And oh, I, I should mention, this is a rehearsal track. Um, this is, um, you all will hear uh, the greatest iteration um, of this uh, music performed on Sunday night. Um, but part of the process is that uh, Alexandra, she created a MIDI score and then she kind of talked me through it, explaining what the different parts were. Um, but it was clear that I was really going to need to hear Kronos perform it to understand the music. And so um, very generously, uh, Alexander flew out here and they arranged a recording session where they could lay down these tracks and create uh, a mix for me to edit to um, back in January. And so then I had uh, something I've really never had before, which is a, uh, a beautiful live recording to, to cut to. And, uh, and that was really a, a great honor and a pleasure to work with. Um, so, but it's not for all ears. You are a very select group who will get to hear this scratch rehearsal track. Um, and this is what I was working with. And so we're going to hear a few minutes of that now. Thanks.
seen uh, and heard today that um, from terrible ruin, terrible decay, quite literal sense, something quite beautiful can be found. Um, I also want to say thanks to the hosts for, for bringing me here. It's actually really inspiring and humbling to be amongst uh, such influential and accomplished artists. For my part, um, my name is Drew, and I'm a hand paper maker. Uh, the, the premise of my work, Combat Paper, is to use another form of, of remnant or memorial or ruin from warfare, and that is the military uniform. And I use the ancient craft of hand paper making to transform that uniform into paper. So to take the clothing, clothing rag that was worn by those who have served um, and to turn it into something else, something beautiful, is the starting point for Combat Paper. Um, for the collaboration, uh, I was lucky enough to be kind of brought into the fold a little bit around what uh, some of the process that these other artists were using in the creation of this work. And so from these, <clears throat> from these stills, uh, or from the, the moving image rather, the stills that were selected, I was fortunate enough to be able to, to, to have Bill pull some as well as pick through uh, some of the selection of what you just saw, some, some moments of the piece that was most interesting, most interesting for me and how they might translate into prints. And um, another uh, source material that I used for this were these portraits. As Bill mentioned, I'm really compelled with um, images that uh, most often what I'm working with are images that people have taken from their own accounts. So often um, service members, from recent conflicts using digital photography, um, photographing what they're seeing through their lens, but also the faces of these young people who've um, have been faced with war. So these portraits, uh, this is a part of a larger panorama of these doughboys about to be sent off to the war. Um, and these come from the archives of the MacArthur uh, Museum in Arkansas, where I have a connection there. Um, and so from the, the still images, from uh, the archive, as well as these portraits, and then of course, the, uh, some of the notes um, that Alexandra had used and her process. So from these source materials, I used um, 
a type of printing that required me to translate these images into positive images. So this is, I was an artilleryman in the army, um, and this particular scene of these people setting up a, a, a cannon on the rooftop of a town was uh, totally flooring to me, as well as the fact that they're standing on a ladder and scouting out what positions they might attack. So taking something like this, translating it into a positive image, <clears throat> excuse me, basically creating pure contrast so that I can burn it into a silk screen or a simple stencil. Um, so here's some other examples of these images that have been translated into the high contrast positive taking those and burning them into a silk screen. Now silk screen most often, uh, there's actually some examples of it in the hallway out here. Um, these from the 74 prints that are on the wall, the old serographs there. But uh, it's most often um, printing with a squeegee or ink onto a dry surface. In this instance, what I'm doing is I'm printing with paper pulp onto wet sheets of paper. So paper is a quite elegant, fascinating thing in that uh, it, it accentuates the natural property of plant fibers. Now, when plant fibers are mechanically altered, when they're beaten and then uh, gathered together in a, a pulp slurry and into sheet form, a hydrogen bond occurs between these plant fibers. So by printing on a wet sheet of paper with wet pulp, I'm able to use that process and basically uh, print inside of the sheet, is how I think of it. Instead of a wet print on top of a dry surface, it's wet on wet. So I spray this very finely beaten pulp through these stencils. Um, and it's, it's almost like painting more than it is printing, because each one is unique into it of itself. So uh, this is my way to interpret some of uh, these materials and what can be a further way to activate um, the interface of hand paper made from uniforms. So here's uh, the first step of, of adding some context. Um, then I can layer another. So here's a, a, a zoomed in um, stencil graph of some of these, these young soldiers and then printing them again. So you can really build a conversation or a narrative quite quickly and accessibly with this process. And as was mentioned before, tomorrow, um, the pulp printing the, from four to six here in this room, I'll be doing the same thing and asking people to make their own prints. So um, that's the trick with combat paper is it's free and open to everyone. All you gotta do is show up. So um, direct translation quite in its simplest form. So taking this and printing it once, you know, it carries it, uh, carries the memory. But the building of the narrative is the thing that's interesting to me. So here's the, the portrait of the soldiers. And so often has been uh, spoken so eloquently as well today is um, when we think of war, it always comes back to the human cost, right? And that's what carries in our, um, and rips us apart the most. So with every image that's seen of war, I can never shake the fact that it's uh, drowned in the faces of those who've perished in it. So like the degradation of the film, there's also these, these ghost images of these soldiers that are coming from within it. Um, and then, of course, the, the notes and composition of the Beyond Zero. So these are, the, these are uh, I think, a sort of a first iteration, these prints, um, and what I hope to be a continuing dialogue with, uh, with the collaborators. And um, so I've, I've made a set of them. I've brought them along with um, paper is much more interesting in practice than in theory. So I have those to share with you all. And, um, and yeah, I hope there'll be a, a, a many more sets to come from it. But again, it's, um, it's really thrilling more than anything else to be in the context of uh, music and composers and filmmakers and performing artists. As a pa paper maker, as a veteran, this is a, a venue or an avenue that is something that's uh, rarely afforded. So I'm really, really proud to be here. So thank you. I was going to say exactly the same thing that you just said, that I'm uh, to be here with Alexandra and Bill and Drew, um, and I am representing um, the other members of Kronos and, and the entire uh, organization of the Kronos Performing Arts Association. Um, and what I would like to focus on for a minute is the... Um, well, this is the 40th year of Kronos, and, and so one of the ways 
that we were thinking of um, kind of marking that occasion is by um, in a certain way looking back and investigating um, things that we've never investigated before and then trying to propel things forward as well. And when I think of um, the time around 1914, I think of the very early days of recording, the recording industry. And one of the fascinating things we got to do this year was to actually um, make some Edison cylinders in the first recording studio in the world, which is in West Orange, New Jersey, at the Edison um, um, Historical Museum. And we could, let's, let's play about 30 seconds of track number four, can we? This is uh, Kronos uh, at the Edison Museum. So I bet you never thought you'd hear us play Bach. <laughs> um, and so we were playing right into a horn, and we had never done that before. And that, was, that might have been take one, because later we had two horns. Uh, yeah. Um, but one of the things you notice is the amount of other information. And everything I've heard here today um, is fascinating to me because, like, the, for example, the way you're, you're layering information. Well, that was happening in the recording industry. Uh, and what Bill is doing, it, it, it's amazing how consistent people are, actually, when you think about it. Mm -hmm. Let, let's, let's play just a little bit. So I, I mentioned um, the beginning of the recording industry. But also, and, and so the three-minute song became something, you know, the Edison cylinder only goes for, I, I think, um, about three minutes and something. Um, well, one of the things Bartok was doing was he was recording uh, music by amazing musicians from all over uh, Hungary and Romania and Turkey. Yeah, and also Northern Africa. Um, and. Basically, you could say that he, the whole field of ethnomusicology began around that time. Let's just play a little bit of the Romanian folk dance. This would be um, track two. So this is the source material that Bartok used. During World War I, he turned that piece into a piano piece, and later it got turned into a violin and piano piece. Um, so musicians were doing a lot of amazing things right then. And when I think about that time, I, and then think about the work that we do, I realize the very first piece that we ever rehearsed was the Six Bagatelles of Anton Weber which was written uh, during World War I. And so, so there's a lot of things that, that kind of, the um, abyss, let's say, of, of that war and the gravity of it um, pulled many things into it. And uh, um, when I was talking to Mark uh, Danner the other day, uh, um, we mentioned that the proof of the idea that Einstein had foretold of the black hole was actually proven on the uh, Polish uh, front of World War I by a German soldier who later died on the, uh, You can check it out on um, Google, 
Just Google black hole and you'll find out the guy's name, the physicist. Um, and so the more I thought about it and the more I traded uh, recordings with Alexandra, we, we'd be um, emailing each other, uh, oh, have you heard, uh, have you heard Puccini from 1918? And so pretty soon I'd hear it or she'd get to hear it. We, we, we were trading uh, day and night for months. Or have you heard, uh, what are some of the other ones we did, Alexander? Oh, Mahler. Oh, okay. Let's hear a little Mahler. Uh, how about track three? So this is Mahler. Uh, this is a little before the time, but this is Mahler playing the funeral march from symphony number no. five. <laughs> So what I began to find out is that basically everything starts earlier than you think. And in fact, Saturday's concert is going to, Sunday's concert rather, is going to start earlier. Yeah, it's Sunday. That's right. Um, Sunday's concert is actually going to start at 6.30 because um, for the last year or so I've been thinking about, okay, what, what should the music be that people get to hear as they come into the concert? And so just uh, Wednesday, after thinking about it, thinking about it, I finally came up with a pre-show 35-minute track. And all of those pieces that you just heard will be on that. So if you want to kind of really get the whole event, uh, you need to show up at 6.30. Okay. Um, and one of the things Alexandra introduced me to was the concept of the Italian futurists and the noise box. So could we just hear about 20 seconds of track five? Okay. Now, can you believe it? That was called noise in 1913. I mean, and it was Luigi Russolo who brought that into the concert hall. And so the whole idea even of what noise is has kind of evolved, hasn't it? I mean, uh, I'm sure you've heard noise <laughs> in your lifetime. And uh, you've been, Alexandra, by the way, is the only composer that's ever written music for Kronos while there was a bombing going on over her head. And so that's, that's the reason I thought she ought to be the composer for this piece. Um, that sense of, of reality is very important, I think. And, and um, it, it seems to me that um, in thinking about what the audience will experience on Sunday, um, that there needed to be some kind of a prelude. And Alexandra and I talked about this for a long time. In fact, for a while, weren't you thinking initially that maybe some of the things that ended up in the prelude that we've come up with might even be in um, Beyond Zero? Well, the material of the prelude in the Beyond Zero was one material at the beginning. Right. And then as we were sorting through the ideas, it was clear that I would keep the Bartok for the piece and I would uh, keep the chanting for the piece. And then there were many other uh, examples of music from that time that would uh, become a set of pieces that would be the prelude to the film yeah. and Beyond Zero. Well, one of the things that happened to me is that um, in exploring, I discovered, um, and it was with the help of, of a musicologist and at... Um, uh, Syracuse University, and he said, well, have you heard Rachmaninoff's All Night Vigil? Well, I, I'd heard it, but I didn't realize that it was written during World War I. And so, um, as Mark 
pointed out with the, the map, um, there was this front that was attempting to take over Russia. And right at that very same time, the society in Russia was disintegrating like a Bill Morrison uh, shot. <laughs> I mean, it, literally, it was, it was like it was, the society was made out of nitrate film or something. It was just dissolving. And Rachmaninoff, I never thought in my lifetime I would play Rachmaninoff. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you that. I never thought that. <laughs> but all of a sudden, late one night, I heard uh, uh, the fifth of the Vespers, and I began to read about it. And first of all, Rachmaninoff thought it was one of the two best pieces he ever wrote. That's number one. Number two, it features the lowest note ever sung by a human being, ever notated for, for a human being goes down to a B flat below the cello C string. And um, up until that point, I think maybe Mahler might have used that note as well, but uh, Rachmaninoff uh, ended his whole piece with it. And so I, I remember I was in touch with Alexandra and I said, you've got to hear this note. Well, it turns out she grew up with the recording uh, that was outlawed in Russia. The first recording of this music was made in Russia, but it was it was shipped to Serbia, Yugoslavia, uh, you know, the Eastern Bloc, right? Um, and, and so anyway, the more I found out, the more I thought, we've got to play this. And it was um, this incredible bringing together of the Orthodox traditional music. So there's Serbian Orthodox, Ukrainian, Russian, Greek, um, might be one more, I believe. And the idea of turning um, a, an one of our instruments, retuning it, it changes its entire being when you do that. It's, it's a very dramatic thing to do. And so what's going to happen on Sunday, right before Alexander's piece, is Sonny, our cellist is going to tune down to the B flat. And the B flat, the lowest note ever sung by a human being, is the way beyond zero starts. And ends. And ends, yeah. Yeah. And so the, the little uh, prelude that I've spent a year or so curating begins with the, the Alexandra's transcription of the Orthodox chant that Beyond Zero ends with. And then what we're trying to do is, is um, kind of excavate um, that time in a musical way. And so you will hear, for example, um, a piece that Stravinsky wrote in, in 1914, uh, three pieces for string quartet. And in, in five minutes, he takes the listener through almost like his entire creative history. It's an astonishing work. And then there's music of uh, Charles Ives. We, we've never played this in concert before. But when we, when we made the Black Angels album, one of our tracks was Kronos playing with Charles Ives. There's this amazing recording. He, in, in, um, it was about 1917 he created this song called They Are There. He was so upset about America getting into the, the World War. But then it was in 1943 when, yet again, there was another war. He went into a recording studio, and by this point he was in his 70s, and he'd had a stroke, I believe, and he was, his health was not good. And he was so angry. And so here's America's greatest composer beating the crap out of a piano and yelling this song. And I thought, this is one of the greatest things I've ever heard. And so we had to find a way of playing with it. And anyway, we're going to do that for the first time live um, Sunday night. And uh, so there'll be that. There'll be music of, uh, from Greece, uh, Smyrna Eco Minore. There'll be a number of uh, things. That, 
the idea basically is um, some of the music we would have been playing if we were around in 1914, you'll get to hear Sunday night. Thankfully not I, I don't know if uh, uh, there are any Thankfully questions from the question. audience, but I just wanted to share a couple of thoughts, and I have a, a question or two for all of you. Uh, a way to, to kind of bridge this uh, collaboration is under a, a rubric that is, I think has been explored uh, very deeply by a contemporary thinker, Susan Sontag, and it's the idea of the, of an, the possibility of an aesthetics of extreme situations. And, and Sontag, at least in my reading on Sontag, uh, really goes through a sort of phenomenology of this aesthetics and a, a series of possibilities. And I think you've sort of covered all of them, but I just wanted to rehearse this for a second. Uh, you know, after all, it's music, so it needs to be rehearsed, right? right. And, and so the, the main chapters are, First of all, a documentary approach to extreme situations. The, and, and I think this emerges very well in terms of researching documentary footage, sound, um, getting into the archives, okay? And, um, and letting the archives sort of speak and come, and, and in a way, use, using, for instance, using uniforms as a, as a primary source. Of, 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 this, of this conversation. Uh, another uh, variant of, a, of the aesthetic of extreme situations is diversion, is moving off the subject, uh, almost pretending that the subject and the horror and the trauma is not there and, and, and going in, in different directions. Uh, and this, uh, this also can be done through uh, the use of the absurd, for example. It's a, it's a, it's a great way to divert from the from the core of the subject. And, and then again, another very important uh, way to decline this topic is silence. Reducing, and this is a very deep issue both in terms of philosophy and of course of sound, but uh, the, 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 the use of silence as a way to confront the extreme situation. And finally, and I think that this really comes forth in all of your contributions so, uh, so point in, poignantly, is the evocative power of fragments. Fragments which are both quotations but also the ruins of the past, both the historical past and the personal past, and how all of these elements sort of uh, come together. So uh, that was my other thought while uh, going across the Midwest earlier in, in the week, and I, I did not preface your, your, converse, your contributions with that, but I wanted to bring it forth because I think that these rubrics are very important, and, uh, and after all, Sontag and Sarajevo and, and the war are, are very deep and important link here. Uh, but I wanted to ask you all to go back to the dynamics of your collaboration, which I think emerged so well, and uh, among the themes that, that I think we all noticed there uh, is one of overlapping. You had a wonderful tendency of completing each other's sentences or asking for permission about covering this or that. And uh, so the issue of overlapping of competence, I think is a very interesting one in this collaboration among all four entities, you as four of you, etc. cetera. And uh, the other issues that of ownership, how are you dealing with uh, ownership of this, uh, uh, this collaboration, which is, uh, made of so many pieces that all seem to fit so, so well together. And finally, in the course of creating this, and I think this is a crucial question given the topic, uh, war, that we are uh, confronting, how have you dealt with conflict? Is, has there been any conflict in, in, in the making of this? Mm -hmm. and, and so how did you, if there was, uh, how did you negotiate it or avoided it or you thought there might have been conflict? So these are my uh, questions for you, and I think a question voicing from the audience, if any of you wants to take that, and with that I just leave the floor to all for you again, but is if you can reflect a bit more for all of us on the title, Beyond Zero, and how you came to, in a, if, if there was an agreement, how you came to that title. Uh, I don't know in which order you want to do this, but maybe we can pick up, we can follow the order of the beginning of this. 
So what first? Um, maybe about collaboration. Um, the, I think for me personally, to work with other artists is really so much greater than to do anything by yourself. Because when we do things by ourselves, usually we know the territory. And even if we think we are going beyond what's known and what's um, already understood or developed, we sometimes don't go as far as if there would be other people who would push us to explore further. So, um, but then again, I, I have collaborated with Kronos a lot. So there is also mutual trust and understanding and the feeling that if uh, we discuss something that's, that doesn't seem to me as my most natural choice, then I definitely need to look at that because there must be something there that um, there is a reason why I don't see it and I should be seeing it. So any time when I would feel that, the, that um, I'm going into the territory that I wouldn't choose by myself, um, I gladly go there because it's always the place that's really um, important for the work later. Uh, so collaboration has been it feels like it's one huge open territory. And when people, um, as here we all, um, we all know what we want to do, but then the space in between is the, the space that's most interesting. And I think all of us have that awareness. So where are the, the, the points where, where we touch or don't touch are the, the, the moments that are uh, extremely exciting. So um, that, that's been great. Oh, the title? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe David should talk about the title. I will, yeah, will you start? I might continue. Yeah, yeah. The, the title, I, I mean, I remember. Uh, so there was that particular moment where, where I found out that this, it was this German soldier on the Polish front was able to prove the idea of a black hole. Uh, and I just thought, so much of our lives have um, um, the more I think of it, the more I it, it, it's as though the, the World War I uh, keeps pulling things back to itself. At the same time it, it generated a lot of things too. And so I, I called up Alexander and I said, I have a great idea for a title. Black hole. And I, I could tell she hated it. <laughs> she just hated it. Uh, uh, well, I've known her for 15 years, and there was a particular kind of silence, you know. And and I think she started talking about the lunch she had or something. I I, I can't remember. Um, so anyway, you know, th this was months ago, and we kind of kept thinking about it, and you know, and and she came up. Well, maybe you should tell about Beyond Zero. Well, then we had several other titles, just trying to see how, how they feel. But I wanted to refer again to that place where, um, also in science from that time, uh, zero is the place of nothingness, but also the place of greatest potential. And I, I really see wars like that. This is the total nothingness and destruction, but also from that a great awareness can arise, and it is the place of incredible potential. So I thought beyond zero would be uh, would be that place, and the peace could be that. But also from that time in 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 arts, uh, the abstraction and um, all ways that the form was manipulated um, into into symbols and some kind of purity that has not existed, uh, that had not existed before that. That was another reference, specifically um, Malevich, the, the painter, who um, also wrote about the concept of zero and at that time. So that was another reference that I felt, besides the fact that I really liked how it sounded, which I think is important. <laughs> uh, there were those two other things that were, that I related to it. And that's how we agreed. Did, did, did you know that, that it was Pete Seeger that, that changed the words to, uh, um, we shall 
it used to be we will overcome, and he, it was Pete Seeger that changed it to we shall overcome. I didn't know. Because he thought it sounded better and it was easier for the mouth to, yeah. So beyond zero. Okay, but then it became clear that beyond zero, well, what is that? I mean, uh, you know, I was confused by it. And so I remember we had a coffee somewhere. Uh, we were kind of almost negotiating this title. And, um, and then the idea of, uh, okay, if you add a colon and then you say 1914 to 1918. So 1914, it looks like minus 1918. And, and then we both said, well, that really is beyond zero. Uh, and so that's how we ended up with that. So that the, the, the complete title is Beyond Zero, 1914, minus 1918. I'm just learning that the title's Beyond Zero, 1914, <laughs> minus 1918. I always, I always thought it included those four years, but I never thought it as a a mathematical abstraction, so I'm, I'm still wrapping my mind around that, you know. Give me well, that was a, a negotiating point, uh, the, yeah, with Alexander. Yeah. So I'm, I'm slipping into my own black hole here, I think. <laughs> um, there was something about uh, Einstein being in a patent office uh, in Germany at the time and uh, assigned uh, this task of of trying to, uh, well, he came up with the theory of relativity because there was this problem of trying to establish uh, uh, surveillance lines with people if you had to know where you were at any given time. And it was getting very tricky because you could be in somebody else's territory in a colony. And so um, this idea that you could establish an, a zero and a, a relative distance was uh, something that um, was a byproduct of colonial occupations and um, and very much a, a part of the time. So I think it's it, it somehow makes sense to talk about black holes and um, sort of these convergences of time, um, and that also as as we became faster and uh, and trains would needed to keep schedules that would uh, run to keep a track. Uh, uh, clear before you had 12 noon in any given town was just whenever the sun was overhead. Uh, all of a sudden we became a much faster society and we needed to establish a 12 noon in each uh, lateral time zone. So um, these are products of speed, I guess. You know, um, I can't remember all your questions. Uh, but we, many there were so many. It, it, uh, it, oh, what was what, collaboration, collaboration and, and conflict? conflict. Um, I don't remember too much conflict on this project. Um, uh, it's not something that um, inspires or generates uh, my art. Um, uh, I, I'm very choosy about who I work with, and um, in this case, uh, I felt very blessed to be surrounded by these artists. And um, and I think Alexander, both Alexander and David, alluded to their trust in each other and just based on their work together and the work they've done in the past, uh, I had a lot of faith in them um, and um, appreciated the trust that they placed in me that they could give me this piece and uh, eventually a film would come back and nobody breathed down my neck or said, where is this thing or uh, what's it going to mean or anything like that. There was just uh, uh, the idea that I was going to show up this weekend with a film, I guess, was. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, should, I just want to say one thing. That the, uh, we were talking about this before um, the session here, and, and the, the ending. Um, the, the ending of the film is absolutely unbelievable, and I encourage everybody to come on. on if and nothing stay else, stay to the ending, right? Yeah, stay to the end. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you, you you can come. Yeah, if you come around, yeah, come come around eight thirty. You'll miss the whole music and and uh, the pre-show and the you know our set and all that. But you'll see the ending, and um, uh, the whole idea of recycling things. And and one of the conflicts that that you that hasn't been mentioned yet is is 
the American War in Vietnam. And, and we did another piece with um, Von An Vo, who uh, uh, was born in Hanoi and now lives in, in Fremont. And for a piece that we did with her, her father and her husband brought over two uh, North Vietnamese artillery shells. And we used them in that piece. And the other day, uh, uh, I called her up and asked if we might borrow them for this piece. And so everything that, that Drew has said and everybody said um, of, of making use of what we have and creating layers, I think it's a very important part of this, this piece. And plus they sound really amazing. They really are incredibly beautiful. They almost sound like these, these bells and these, um, yeah. And I think in combination with what I saw of, of the ending of Bill's film, it's, it's absolutely the right sound. There's a, not even a question about it. I want to thank everyone who participated in the panel, everyone who made it possible in our performances. Uh, thank you for just bringing so many ideas and uh, uh, so many possibilities uh, to us. And I guess we're all looking forward. I think you made an excellent plug for, oh. for Sunday. So I don't think I need to add any to that. But uh, we're all looking forward to the performance on, on Sunday. Thank you very, very much.